Welcome to Inflection Point Podcast, where we cultivate change from the inside out as we ponder the Cairo question. Will Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which he was born? We stand on the belief that dismantling racism goes beyond laws and legislation or politics and economics. Here, anti-racism activation is presented as an inside job where personal transformation and accountability impacts social change. So take a seat at the anti-racism activation table with inflection point podcast well hello and thank you for tuning in to the latest episode of inflection point podcast where we are dedicated to the art of listening and authentic conversation we challenge our audience to listen actively and intentionally for the purpose of self-awareness in-depth perspective taking personal transformation and ultimately social impact the 2024 theme explores the art of community conversation in today's climate of equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, and book banning. I am your host, Anita Russell, and here's a quick hello from co-hosts Mavis and Gail. Hi, I'm Mavis Bauman. I'm so glad you're here. It's going to be Hi, good. Gail, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Gail Hunter, and I'm glad you're here also. Thanks. So in this community conversation, we share a perfect example of the Kwanzaa principle Ujamaa in action through the Ujamaa Collective and Artisan Boutique located right here in the heart of historic Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, in the heart of historic Hill District in the city of Pittsburgh. I want to make sure I call that out absolutely uh, correctly. So there are three names that are prominent with uh, the when you hear the name Ujima Collective. And those three names are Salida Hickman, who is the founder, Lakeisha Wood, the executive director, and Frankie Harris, a merchandiser and special events director. And in the studio today, we are blessed to have Frankie Harris here as our special guest. And she's going to tell us all about Ujima Collective. She is a mother, a grandmother. And I love this statement right here. She is the healing presence at Ujima Collective. She has been described as the conscientious spirit behind the healing vibe and nurturing energy that supports the community when one walks through Ujima's doors. And I've had that, that experience of walking through Ujima's doors for the very first time, which was many years ago. So I've been walking through those doors ever since. So Frankie, I'm going to turn it over to you. I just want to welcome you to our program. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have you here. And if you could just start off by telling us who you are, telling us a little bit about your personal story. Thank you so much for this opportunity, which often is not realized the value of it. But I want you to know I recognize its value fully. So again, my name is Frankie Harris. Um, I want to make a small correction. Lakeisha Wolf, like the animal, is the name. Oh, of I'm so the, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. We're human. So I like that part about us. Um, and she is the director at this point, executive director of Ujima Collective. One of the ways that I ended up in this space, which is very, very organic, the lover of all things beautiful and of African um, means and the hands that touch and make, I was attracted to with space all by myself. No one needed to invite me in or no needed to say anything to me. I made my way in. So first, just supporting Ujima because I like to support us wherever we are. And the idea that I was able to do that literally right up the street from where I live was amazing. And I was so um, blown away just by what I found inside. Um, Ujima in its essence is it embodies the principle of Ujima, which is cooperative economics. And you talked about Salita Hickman. Well, here's the backstory to that story. There were women, Salita being one of them, makers. And I don't know exactly how many women, but they would gather in their libraries. 
And through those conversations and their opportunities to do what are called vending opportunities, no one had a, a, a physical space to sell anything. But what they would do is collectively pull their monies together, take these vending opportunities in a collective way, share the cost of the table or whatever the fees were, and they would vend their wares through these different experiences, which is Ujima Collective's backstory of how they even got there. So this community was the seed that started this process and experience. <clears throat> their opportunity to have a brick and mortar excuse me, their opportunity to have a brick and mortar store was the whole mindset behind what their goal and their dreams were. So with the onset of that experience, the collective mind that everyone carried, the will for the women specifically to support one another in this process was the actual birth of Ujima Collective. As a resident, however, I was just a supporter but there was a day in the conversations where they invited me to simply do a window display. Of course I said yes, but what that meant for me was an opportunity to shine the light in my own community. And I was able to do it with the messages and the different artists that I was able to engage. So that's literally how this journey for me began. Wonderful, wonderful. So one of the things that I love about this story, and I, I'm actually going to go back a little bit and uh, share how I actually got connected to uh, Ujima. It was back in 2017. Um, I had not been living in Pittsburgh for years. I came back to Pittsburgh when my mom was sick. Right. And this is actually the same year that I met Gail. But at the same uh, in that same time, I also met uh, the folks over at Ujima because I was doing some work with the Homeless Children's Education Fund upstairs. And so the first day that I walked into the building, this was the first spot that I saw before I even got upstairs. And so I made it a point in my mind, I need to come back downstairs when I get done with my meeting to come and check this uh, place out. And like I said, that was in 2017. And here we are. I'm still very well connected to uh to that organization. So Frankie, I, what, one of the things that really interests me um, is the significance of the Ujima Collective's location in the Hill District, particularly when you think about the history of the Hill District. So I have this quick quote, and it came from a Huffington Post uh, article called Pittsburgh Hill District, The Death of a Dream. But this quote says, the Hill District or Little Harlem as it was referred to in the 30s through the 50s, was one of the elite African-American neighborhoods in America. In America. Right. So can you talk to us a little about a bit about the connection and why that connection is so significant? Because there were a lot of things that were going on when things began to shift and sort of moving into this space of disempowerment, people not investing, um, highways being built so that people could get in and out of the city a lot faster. But all of that impacted the Hill District. So can you tell us a little bit about the significance of the collective, Ujima Collective, being in the Hill District? And maybe, it's, I'm sorry, Gay, I really want you to chime in also because you're, you, you're also from the city of Pittsburgh as well. Yes. One of the things about the Hill District specifically is how it has a virtual international feed and stream. The artists and artisans who came, the way that they were able to not just be in this community, but have one of the best times ever in terms of the art, in terms of the music. And that's where the crossroads, if you will, intersect. The crossroad is the Hill District because people mm -hmm. literally came from all around the country. And we, we don't need to talk about all the jazz grades. I mean, they're, they're on the walls throughout the community. The murals also show you the different individuals that have come through this community and brought some of the most phenomenal art, some of the most phenomenal music. And mm -hmm. so I call it the heartbeat. And I can tell you as a, as a child, probably about 10 years of age was the first time I came to the hill. The energy was palpable. It's something that you, if you experience it, 
You might not have words for it, but you certainly feel it. And the vibrancy of the hill by itself, it's it's a shining jewel. It's a it's a diamond. It's something that we endeavor to hold. We endeavor to keep. And that's what Ujima Collective is doing. We're intentionally here because of that legacy. Mm -hmm. And we endeavor to be a part of not just what was, but what is to come. And that's why we focus on the, the artists and artisans in the way that we do, because that vibrancy, is it, it's our life's work. It's our literal life's work. I, so, Gail, I, any comments? I think you I, told us that you had, I think your sister that used to hang out on the Hill District yeah, a lot. My, my older sister, she's about nine years older than I am, and she used to go, she went to the Art Institute in Pittsburgh, and she would go up to the Hill and listen to jazz and, and music. I mean, she just, you know, because that was a place to go. Um, and it was just, I, it's such a tragedy when they, they built this, this civic arena, that, that big arena, and they literally destroyed the whole bottom part of the hill. I mean, and that's when everything, I think, went downhill, literally. Yes, that's what's called the lower hill. You're talking oh, about a mm -hmm. whole dynamic that oh. took place that can never be, it, I won't say undone, but yeah. it's something that existed that you can't replace, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it displaced so many people and businesses. So that was the tragedy right there by itself was what was lost that can never be regained. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope that that doesn't mean that we that the hill can't be rebuilt. That that you know that center out of that that I know different people have different dreams and visions of what it would look like. And I was at, at a meeting once. Um, there was an old grade school that my nonprofit was looking at, maybe you know, using to um, for a facility uh, and as a place to. And the people that were at the meeting just have so much energy to want to reconnect and to want to rebuild. And so I really hope and pray that that does happen because it would be a second tragedy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think an anecdotal story that comes to my mind that kind of resonates with this whole uh, community connection and all of that is, um, I believe it was Willie Stargell when he was playing for the Pirates and there was that restaurant on the hill. And every time Willie Stargell would hit a home run uh, on the radio station Whammo, it would say chicken on the hill. Chicken on the hill and with Will. <laughs> yes, I remember it vividly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. True, true story. True exactly, story. exactly. Because it just goes to show you, here's the, this team, they're playing you know, over in the stadium but then there's a connection immediately to the community that is related to every time Willie Stargell, which is one of the black players on the team, knocks it out the park. People get free chicken. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> so it just, yeah, it was just oh, that's adorable. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, like a really cool story. Um, to kind really of community out. that way. Yeah. You know, to connect. Um, to people that aren't even in the room. That's wonderful. Correct. That's fun. Like, what you're doing with it with you know Ujma, that that it's that that collective that being able to really embody that and what you're doing, right? I mean it's just and that's why I think that concept is brilliant and I think it's needed everywhere. And uh, I'm so glad to hear that you are really creating it there in the hill. Mm -hmm. and, in some aspects, mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean to cut you off, but in some aspects, I want to share as we're having this conversation mm -hmm. that Franco Harris mm -hmm. is someone who in our community, yeah. he was a part of the revitalization. Mm -hmm. The Crawford Grill, which is one of the names that resonates around the country, um, that was one of the parts of mm -hmm. um Re revitalization, I'll say it that way, that he wanted this community to experience. And so he had literally come into the community, had begun to work, you know, with community partners to, I would say, somewhat rebuild, reestablish that particular link in, in this community. So, of course, at this moment, now that he has left us, um, there there's a gap, but there's still that energy. And so I think Ujima in some ways harnesses that because we were part of a program that was right on, it was like a dedication for the Crawford Grill at that time. And Ujima was instrumental in seeding that and supporting it. 
and helping to present that to uh, to the community. Just it was last year. I'm going to say it, it was that was done last year. So mm -hmm. the work continues. Yes, yes, it does. Because along the same lines, there is the August Wilson House. Um, right over on the Hill District. Um, as many of our audience members know, August Wilson was this incredible playwright that was born and raised uh, in the city of Pittsburgh and lived on the Hill District. And they have taken his home and converted it into this like studio slash event space and and all of that. And it's just a, a just a a really great tribute to what can happen when the community does pull together. And um, you spoke of Franco Harris. It was Denzel Washington that played a key role in getting the um, August Wilson house um, renovated and changed over into this very different kind of uh, space. I wanted to call out one other thing that was in this Huffington uh, Post article it was a statement that said the lack of external funding crushed opportunities for Africana people to establish and grow their own businesses within the community, to which Lakeisha Wolf um, replied, we wanted to emphasize that if we are going to have a healthy and safe community and see Ujamaa become a reality, we had to build a community together through combining our perspectives and our cultural past. That, I, when I saw that quote, that is such a powerful uh, way of kind of talking about what was energized as Ujima was coming into uh, fruition. Indeed. Uh, to even yeah. try to understand that is powerful. Just to mm -hmm. immerse yourself in that comment by itself and let it kind of right. wash over you to, to your mm -hmm. point of understanding. So I, I hear that someone has a, a comment they would like to make or share. I'll be yeah. open to hearing that. I, thanks. Thanks, Frankie. I was just going to remind our listeners who might not have heard this before that Ujama is one of the principles of Kwanzaa and it has to do with people. economic collective, right? And so, um, Frankie, the other day you were telling us about how these collectives come together and bring their skills and offer each other their skills. Can you tell that story again? It's so beautiful how everyone sure. has what they need because of that collective. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Ujima is the fourth principle of Kwanzaa. And we as an entity, we are women-led. We are a nonprofit. We simply work with women of African descent to support and to help them in developing their businesses. So what you need to understand, and I think women do understand this, is we're more than one thing. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of various things throughout the day, throughout our lives. We are just busy doing things in general. But what Ujima has done was taken an actual focus on women because we understand that they're the not just the, the seat of the family, but a lot of businesses. So what we do, what we do here outside of the economic Part because we think of that in monetary ways. But Ujima thinks of it differently, not just monetarily, but in skill sharing. If I know how to make soap, what I do is I teach other women how to make soap. If I sew and I have, you know, women in my community, I would do the same. I would teach them how to sew. If I make body care products, I would do the same. What we call that is simply this skill sharing. In this space, in this room that I'm in right now, we have had sewing classes in this room. Women have gone from making a pattern to making a full skirt. We have had sessions in here in which we've had body care products that we have created. One of the biggest things we ever undertook was called the abundance box. The concept of the abundance box was all of us together sharing all of our skills, we created over 21 handmade products and put them in one box. The reason it was called the abundance box is because inside of that box, it was enough for you to share. Mm. The beauty of that ended up being that people purchased the box for the holiday and would take the box to their family gatherings. And inside of the box, they would allow their family members and friends to choose an item from the box. You're talking about teas aprons, fabric covered frames, body care products, 
All of those things were made by hand right here in this space. And so for us, it's what we have to share. And Ujima as a collective, yeah. it's a sharing experience that we do. But it's it's to understand this. This work allows all of our needs to be met. It simply does. It's like when you know what it is you need and you can turn to someone and get that need met, but then it's the same kind of experience. It, it comes back to you. What you offer, and we say this all the time, we are who we seek to serve. That's why we're in this community. I don't need to go anywhere else. Right here is the work that I'm doing, but I do what I do because it's the same thing I need. So it's not different. It's not odd. It's the normal everyday living. We all need to eat. We all need water. So all these basic needs, but the skill sharing part is one of the biggest things we've ever done that allows women to keep their work schedules, whatever they might be, when they mm -hmm. bring their products in here. When I take them into my hands, I'm going to tell you something. The back story knocks me out. A lot of times what you find with women doing this work is it's multi-generational. I can mm -hmm. literally look at a woman and say to her, do you realize that your grandmother taught your mother and your mother taught you and you're the third generation don't making these teas? Do you know that? They don't think of it like that. Mm -hmm. But it's a skill sharing. And through that process, all of our needs are met. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the literal way of why I do this work that is not really work, mm -hmm. even though it is in my spirit. It, I don't see it that way. I see it as sharing and giving of myself in the ways that I believe I am to do for my community. And that that's really the heart of what Ujima represents. And it is the literal fourth principle of Kwanzaa that we live literally every day. Yeah, that is so amazing. And I am very happy to say that I am one of the community partners at Ujima. One of my books is there. I've had the opportunity to do a, which I need to come back and do it again when I had the the book talk, um, the author uh, book talk, um, and that was uh, that was a great experience. And again, it was it was nice because I had the so I'm the author, and I had my event in this wonderful community space, and then I had another friend of mine who was a caterer who provided the food in this beautiful space. And so I think just that event in and of itself and the fact that I'm able to have my books there um, kind of speaks to everything that Frankie is talking about. So it's not just within the confines of the store, the space itself, it literally spills out into mm -hmm. the community. We did um, the Kwanzaa celebration, um, at, at, like in between Christmas and New Year's this past uh, this past year. My grandson was with me, my daughter was with me, my fiance was with me. And so it's this whole idea of community that is so incredibly um, vibrant, I would say, yes. in that space. Absolutely. It, it's vibrant and it keeps the money People spend their money locally too, so it gets yeah. recirculated and and it doesn't go away. It doesn't drain the community. I love that concept too. You know, instead of always buying from another country, we can, yeah, use our skills here and help each other. Mm -hmm. I just love this idea. Yeah, it's just the whole concept is just incredible. It's like there is no ego state there. There is no. I don't want to tell you from within this year place. It is total generosity mm -hmm. and value and respect and appreciation. Mm -hmm. I don't go on and on. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just, and self sustaining. I mean, it's just, right. it's just beautiful. And that's a good word too self sustaining. Um, mm -hmm. One of the parts of, of what I really like about our work is how many things I've learned. Yeah. To even think of learning this many things at this stage in my life is, is, is semi-crazy. It really is. But what I hold is I hold a great opportunity that I will not squander. Mm -hmm. The younger women, as my executive director is, could be my daughter. Some of the, the, the tech team and the other women, we're literally generations apart, I being the eldest. But what I tell you about how profound this experience is to me and what it actually demonstrates, that's powerful. 
there are messages in and throughout Uchima. And one of them speaks to the to the financial piece, which says where you spend your money is where you create a child. We mm-hmm. don't think like that. Wow. And we have such a disposable mindset a lot of the times. And another statement that's here that that has a high vibration is, do you know who makes your mm-hmm. clothes? Do you know who makes your jewelry, who makes your cakes, who makes all the things that we use every day? We use them, but do you know who makes them? Well, mm. Ujima had a distinct opportunity to sometimes introduce you to the maker, give you an opportunity to hear their backstory about how they even came to do this. And one of the other things that Ujima has also enjoyed is our reach. Mm. We have a global vibration. This is around the world. But also what we learn is it's very much of an African mind. The practice of sharing is not foreign. It's normal. It's the way we're pretty much built and wired when we're really thinking as as in our humanity. I'll say it that way because we see that on a regular basis in this space. And I can tell you there are some powerful stories. I mean, I've had a woman, you know, who had come in, you know, needing a coat or jacket. I mean, these, these are not funny stories. They're real life stories. But when I endeavor to give her cover, then when I look at her and I realize she literally doesn't have any shoes on her feet. This is not a third world country. It's right up the street from where I live. Mm. And so I ask her, I'm like, you know what? Hold on a moment. I need you to just take a seat. So I want to maintain my level of dignity and respect towards her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't want her to feel that I'm in some way diminishing her her plight. So I mm-hmm. try to make sure that I never do that to anyone. You understand? It's like not that not just that the same thing I need, but it's looking at the reality of the people who are right here beside me. So I ask her to have a seat, and I you know, slip off to to the back where often I have and we bring in things to donate to others. And I happen to have just the right pair of shoes for her to put on that day. Um, I am shown daily why I'm here. I'm shown daily why I'm in this community, which is Mm -hmm. the other part of it. The children who come through the door are a blessing and a gift just because they come through the door. Um, We're able to speak to them as we are able to, I don't, I don't want to say the word minister necessarily, because we're really just being, it's a conscious mind. It's a caring mind that we have. Yeah. And so we present ourselves like that to our community every single day. Mm. There's no difference. That is such a joy, isn't oh. it? To just have the right thing that somebody needs. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And it's so antithetical to the way most of us Americans live. We don't know what the person down the street might need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm I think glad- those are the conversations, though. Go ahead, Anita. Sorry. No, I was just going to say I- I'm really glad this is kind of connected to what Mavis just said that you called out the question of Do you even know who made this? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we become such a you know go to the mall. Um, order off of Amazon and, and, and all of that. But that is such a powerful question. Do you actually know the person who made this? Know? And it's a Do different you know? experience when you can purchase something directly from the person whose hands, her their mind, their creativity actually made that item. It brings so much more value. Value to whatever exactly. that thing is um, that you're purchasing. So this is actually a good place because um, we need to uh, take a, a midway break, and then when we come back, I want to jump into a, com- a conversation about cooperation over competition and fair exactly. trade, and talk about the work that you all have done connected to uh, Tanzania. So we're going to take a break, and we'll come back and continue the conversation. So welcome back to Inflection Point Podcast and our community conversations for 2024. We are here with our featured guest, 
Frankie Harris Merchandiser Special Event Decorator at Ujima Collective in the heart of the historic Hill District in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So Frankie, I'd like us to kind of shift our conversation a little bit and talk about this idea of cooperation over competition and fair trade and how all of that relates to women in Tanzania. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that question and the real reality around, and we had a campaign that was titled Cooperation Over Competition. One of the mindsets is that if you make body care products, then there would not be room for my body care products. But in Ujama, that's not the way it is. Mm -hmm. What we understand is that one more than one person, we have room for more than one person in this space. We have room for more than one photographer. We have room for more than one designer. We have room for more than one author. We have room for all the individuals underneath that umbrella of artistry. And we do what we can to allow people to know that there's room for you, that there's space. You know, I, I'll make space, but we do not believe in any way in driving anyone out of business. We don't, we don't believe in any way in diminishing someone's value or their dreams or their gifts. If that's what you do, what we do on, over here specifically is making sure of quite a, well, the jurying process will tell you that what you make should be made of best quality materials that, that you can afford, that what you bring to us is fair trade. We have that as a, as a, very hardcore practice of fair trade. Fair trade means that the products that you use and the items that you carry, there's no harm to anyone who is creating those particular elements or products that you're using. That, however, is harvest, it's humane. That the wages that are, are being paid to individuals doing the work are, are reasonable wages that children are, are not being used, you know, in, in order to harvest or to bring resources to us. So we do our due diligence, if you will, to have that conversation with all our makers to understand that we are a standard. And Ujima has, and this is also a part of, of the way we, we live and harness, we have created a new standard. Mm -hmm. What was typical, average, what everybody else has, et cetera. I mean, you all know about fast fashion. You know, you we we understand that, you know, things, anything that costs you five dollars, you gotta think about that. The material itself is worth more than that. Yeah. So who is making that product? And that's one of the realities that we have to um also tap into where we have to be mindful of who we're dealing with. And we do that by doing investigations, asking questions. Um, and that that's just really, 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 really been important. And that's the part of what fair trade represents for us. And we are fair traders ourselves in and of ourselves as an entity. We are certified in that aspect. And you have to meet certain standards even to be able to do that. But it's important to our work. You know, those standards cannot be, um, we can't squander those. We can't diminish them. Uh, so we're very intentional as we provide resources to others that we ourselves are adhering to, to those standards as well. So it's, it's, it's very important. Um, the global part of fair trade is some of the partners that we have had. Um, one of them is in Tanzania and they are in Karagwe and the point of this particular opportunity was seeding these women who were sewers and makers in Tanzania, but not just with the conversation, having the opportunity to travel to Tanzania to take valuable resources to the women who were already teaching and doing this work. We just wanted to elevate it. We wanted to give them opportunity and shine a light, but that relationship led us to a partnership Mm -hmm. So Lakeisha Wolf and our designer at the time designed skirts 
There were three different lengths of these skirts, and they went to travel to Tanzania. I forget the length of time that they spent. But they bought these materials for the women. They selected the fabrics there, but bought the, bought the equipment and the materials to make these skirts. Listen, this conversation traveled from Pittsburgh to Caragua, where the women were making these skirts. It transformed the women. It transformed the the team that went and it transformed this community. When they came back with these skirts, the community showed up like you would not have believed Mm -hmm. to not just buy them, but to press the skirts, to tag them, to get them ready to go on the floor. And that was probably one of the, that was probably the height of cooperative economics that we've ever experienced. And so we endeavored to do that work consistently. But as we all know, we had a setback with COVID. So things had to be restructured. We had to kind of reel it in a bit. But we're preparing ourselves to stabilize enough to continue to do those kinds of partnerships. And that to me is that that's just growth. When you're able to do that, you're experiencing a level of growth that has value beyond anything that words can ever say you change a life mm-hmm. it's it's life changing absolutely uh, that is such a beautiful uh story and can you uh share also a little bit about the ujama village concept that also came out of tanzania the idea that the village in and of itself is representative of a collective Mm -hmm. because inside of the inside of the village exists all of the things that you need not some all of the things are contained in this one space and so even to be in that type of a dynamic knowing that you don't you're not traveling you know all these different locations to have your needs met the village in and of itself it kind of is almost it's its own ecosystem it's a literal own own ecosystem. And so the idea that we are connected like that and doing the work together, because that's what you see in these kinds of dynamics, it's those who look out, you know, in, in order to make sure resources are available, those who are actually doing the physical work, utilizing the resources. So um, that that's how I see that. That's how it feels to me. And that's what Ujima absolutely represents. We do that on a daily basis here. Um, We try to provide all the resources in our physical space. And that is a big part of the success. It's Mm -hmm. gathering all the resources one needs, placing them inside of a a village, if you will, and Mm -hmm. for all the individuals to be able to have access, because that's the other thing. Um, uh, What I wanted to do is just call call out some of the recognition that uh, Ujima Collective uh, right here in Pittsburgh Mm -hmm. has received. So -hmm. they've been uh, recognized nationally for the innovative approach to the shared economy. Some of these things that we were talking about with the uh, Ujima Collective and the whole village concept and and all of those types of things. So it was really nice to be able to really see beyond this being um, a a Pittsburgh phenomenon, if you will, that they themselves are really connected outside of the city of Pittsburgh, going all the way over to uh, Tanzania and um, having some really solid connections to people that live and do this work in Tanzania. And so one of those was an article. Um, it was called the, pa- I'm sorry, this is a book. Both of these are books, Pathways to Our Sustainable Future, a global perspective from uh, from Pittsburgh. And this by, uh, the book was written by a woman by the name of Patricia DeMarco. And she really kind of looked at Pittsburgh and using Pittsburgh as an example of a pathway to a more sustainable future. And one of the things that she talks about is this cultural arts center, which we once had in um, in the city of Pittsburgh in the, uh, at the Hill District. 
And it, uh, she mentions how it was cut off by road expansion and expressways that made it easier for cars to get in and out of the city of Pittsburgh. But it also drew and destroyed parts of the Hill District, the Lower Hill, as uh, Frankie had referred to um, earlier. And so you're looking at divestments, you're looking at depopulation and things of that nature. And so when the interest arose in people wanting to help one another and putting together this community of caring. And so in the book, they use uh, the uh, Ujima Collective as an incredible example of that, talking about um, things that we can do to invest in our own community, right? Rather than being dependent upon the uh, things that kind of exist outside of the community yet dramatically impact the community. And if you think about, you know, some of the things that we've experienced, some of the things that we've been talking about with um, gentrification and racism and all of these types of things, all of those things were actively flowing in the city of Pittsburgh, negatively impacting the Hill District, right? And then Ujima Collective comes along and they have a very different uh, approach, a very different uh, way of thinking about it. And it's centered around investing in our own community. And in each other. Yeah, I mean, each other, other right? It's really right. it's a community and everyone in the community. It's it's really being able to really value everyone and yes. value to everyone. It's just an incredibly beautiful concept and one that, I think we all need to be able to attach to and create. You know. Absolutely. And this is what the author had to say. The Ujima Collective, investing in our own community, happened out of sheer force of will and determination and harnessing the resources that they could get and drawing people toward it. But getting those resources meant simply tapping into what was already there each other right it's like each opening other. the door to each other and just saying tell me who you are tell me what 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 your gifts and skills are and valuing that and creating a space that she as they have right which is just amazing. i wish i could do that in my own town oh. you know there are craft fairs a couple times a year but it's not the same feeling no, it's not what it's you were saying what she's doing yeah yeah, how you walked in the building. And when she walked in, you can feel this sense of, of camaraderie and and cooperation. Mm -hmm. It's just a great, great concept. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I've been in other spaces very similar. So I've been in, um, for example, in New York, mm -hmm. um, in the, uh, the Harlem it, it used to be called 125 Mart, like years and years ago. And it was very similar to an Ujima collective, except it was more, it was much bigger because a lot of it was outside too. So you literally got to walk from this space here into that space. That's where I first bought my first uh, jar of shea butter <laughs> was at 125 Mart in, in, in New York City. And so it's just an amazing, amazing type of experience. But when you go to Harlem in that area now, it's very different. And it's not nearly the same way that it was. It's like shrunk down. Because mm -hmm. when you think about here in the city of Pittsburgh, one of the entities, if you will, that sort of encrouches on things is the medical community. Um, you know who I'm talking about, Gail. <laughs> right. And it was the same kind of thing in New York. It's Columbia University. I'll just say it. And here in Pittsburgh, it's UPMC. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just uh, if you if you only can see the future through a capitalistic mm -hmm. expansion model where competition is automatically built in. Mm -hmm. Look at how much you destroy in the process. Right. How much you're missing. How yes. much you've missed, right, because of that destruction. And that self-focus and that capitalistic way of looking at everything. Exactly. 
you know, when Frankie was talking about how there's always room for another soap maker mm-hmm. or or something else, and I'm thinking, you know, th- this is art. This is people giving mm-hmm. of their unique selves. They're not going to be the same. No. Oh. You know, the soaps are going to be different. They're going to look different. They might smell different or feel different, right. you know, but it's like, you know, here, if there's another pizza place on the corner, it's like, oh, man, we got to be, <laughs> got to put the last one down. And that's, that's a sad story. Yeah, that, that is. It's very Fewer businesses sad. would fail if we had this sort of attitude. Right. Exactly. Support, exactly. Let's, let's support the community. You know, we'll it's have wanting everybody to succeed. The, pardon? I says wanting everybody to succeed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And when you think about it, there's absolutely no reason for everyone not to succeed. Right. There really isn't. Yeah, that's right. We yeah. create this illusion. Mm-hmm. That when you're going into business, oh, I think Frankie's coming back. Yay. We create this illusion that when you're going into business, that somehow you're supposed to see yourself through this lens of competition. So when you go into Ujima Collective, you don't look at like positioning is not an issue. Like so, if you're a lower market product, you're at the on the bottom shelf mm-hmm. at the store. Whereas if you're a major Right. You know, major competitor, if you will, mm-hmm. it's more at eye level. Right. Whereas Ujima doesn't work like that. In Ujima, everything is like side by side. Right. So they don't have Even a lot of this vertical. Huh? Right. Yeah, they don't have a lot of this vertical positioning. Yeah. It's so much more, it's just horizontal. So when you walk mm-hmm. in, you can look at a shelf full of jewelry that mm-hmm. was made by different artisans. Or you could look at the soaps, you could look at the candles, all of these things that were made by different artisans, but there's no competitive positioning, if you will. Uh, Frankie, we were, um, you know, hoping and praying that you would make it back. (laughs) Good job. I did. I'm 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 the least tech savvy and I don't mind saying that. So my granddaughter, she left already. But you're saying that and I don't know if you can see. Yes. At this oh, moment. Yes. 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 Wow. And what oh. you're saying is absolutely true. Yeah. Oh, my word. These are the teas and the baths and the tinctures mm-hmm. and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. So there is no hierarchy. What you're talking about mm-hmm. is is hierarchy, preferences, yeah. mm-hmm. those exactly. kinds of things. I just try to make sure that the visibility is there. I try mm-hmm. to make sure that the artist's work is seen and displayed uh-huh. to the best of my abilities. Mm-hmm. So this is a bit of a snapshot of the space that I curate on a regular basis. Yeah. And you're looking at over a hundred handmade artists and artisans work. Oh, oh it's, I'm so glad you've got over, your- Over a yeah. hundred. It's wow. just Over a hundred. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful space. Oh, beautiful space and stuff. to be in. Yes, knitted or crocheted yeah. hat. Yes, crocheted hats. I'm telling you, but here's here's the children's area over here. I'm going to show you this mm-hmm. quickly. The books, oh, the yeah. puzzle. Mm. Ujima, we had taken um, nine girls to Donna for a global service learning experience. Mm. These cards wow. came out of that experience. Oh wow. The girls were able to see that the children didn't have anything that represented them. Mm-hmm. The jewelry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. So beautiful. personally, it's always my goal that I honor the artist. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing that I can do is show them their value through my eyes. Yes. Um, I mm-hmm. think that a lot of the time is where things kind of fall is how do you show someone? Without, without just saying, oh, that's great. How do I let you know that by my work? How yes. do I present myself to you and mm. elevate you? Because I recently, um, it's like every year something comes to mind that kind of reminds me. But this year has been elevate everything. Mm. Elevate literally everything. The simplest thing deserves to be elevated. Absolutely. And that by itself, it increases its value 
automatically increases its value. So, yeah, I'm glad I was able to find my way back. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, yes. so we, yeah, and we are almost um, out of time. And so what I'd like you to do, Frankie, is call out where can the audience go to find out and learn more about Ujima? Ujima, we're located 1901. Center Avenue, Suite 103 in the Hill District. And actually, we also have, um, we pretty much own all the platforms, but yeah. www.ujimacollective.org is a website. And then once you do that, you'll not only see not only who we are, but you'll see what we're up to. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of partnerships. We just had what's called... Um, a health fair that we participate in every single year. And we give as many opportunities to the community to not just come out, but to benefit from the knowledge that um, the community has assembled. Like we have all mm -hmm. of these different things that, um, that just, and, and one of the things, one, one of the sisters, she's like, Ujima keeping us health, healthy and making us wealthy. You mm -hmm. know, and wealth is different. You know, health health is is probably one of the most valuable things that we have right now. Um, money's nice, but your health invaluable. But invaluable, yeah. So, nineteen oh one Center Avenue, and that's where you'll find us. Wonderful. And I actually had the opportunity to attend the last um, the last event. Uh, Jerome, uh, Jerome is my fiance. He and I uh, came and uh, visited, and the thing that I loved the most was the drumming. Cause we got to yes. draw. <laughs> so that was, that was like super, super, super exciting. So like I said, we are nearly out of time. Um, so I just want to, uh, I usually close with a particular quote and here is today's quote in order to bring an existing paradigm. I'm sorry. I'm going to start all over in order to change an existing paradigm you do not need to struggle to try and change the problematic model. You create a new model and make the old one obsolete. And that came mm -hmm. from R. Buckminster uh, Fuller. And as always, we always re relate this, uh, whatever the topic is, we relate it back to the Cairo question. The Cairo question is what sparked this whole entire thing that we call Inflection Point Podcast. And at the time, Kyra was a baby. Now he's four years old. And here's the question. The question has not changed. Will Cairo have to protest in his life front, lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which he was born? So that ultimate question is based on everyone who is listening to this. What is your personal accountability what will you do to ensure that Cairo and his contemporaries have that birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which they were born? We all have a role to play. And I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frankie, from the bottom of my heart for you coming on and sharing the significant role that Ujama Collective plays for Cairo. Thank you. And thank for all so of us, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all. So for those of you who have been listening, thank you for joining us on Inflection Point Podcast here on Transformation Talk Radio. We are here every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. Eastern time. We're always excited to see you as we immerse ourselves in new themes around community conversation. So we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. The journey towards anti-racism and social change doesn't stop here. Truth, reconciliation, and healing come from ongoing, open, honest, and deliberate conversations. Continue to dive in and deconstruct your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs as we band together to manifest social change. Tune in to Inflection Point Podcast every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. 
Eastern here on TransformationTalkRadio.com for more conversations about how we can cultivate change from the inside out.